to get through this very tight, you can see it here on the screen, this chicane, and that's where the problems were occurring last evening. Once again, it's warmer today than what it was yesterday. Not as windy. Windy uh, conditions, not really a factor here. It does keep the track dry, but uh, with all the grandstands and all the structures around here, it really blocks the wind from the racetrack. It does. These cars aren't affected as much as the IRL cars here, which are running on the same uh, card here this weekend. But Bobby Orgel there, he's running the Miguel chassis, which is a car from France. His team, DSTP Motorsports, are always looking for that winning edge. And they feel that this car, with its very narrow track, they've actually gone one extent further than that. They've narrowed up the front suspension by five inches and that really takes away a lot of the drag aspect of the race car. One of the promising rookies, one of some 11 rookies in the race, is Mark Dismore from Greenfield, Indiana. Not starting where he would normally want to start. He's back in the 17th starting position, which should give us some great onboard cameras from uh, the orange number 13. And Orgel, uh, the pole winner, is starting up in front with nothing in front of him right now but the pace car. And you can see how narrow that front track is. Absolutely. It's really like a pencil there. And it really means it doesn't have to punch such a big hole in the air. And it's not going to create such a drag factor and really give a draft factor for the cars behind him as well. As we come down off the banking, uh, as uh, we get ready for uh, another lap of warm up, let's go back to John Visignano. Well, of course, the story here last night were all the accidents in turn one. You've mentioned it already. I went to the driver's meeting this afternoon, and I haven't heard a dressing down like that since my parochial high school days back in Des Moines, Iowa. There are real threats of penalties, suspensions, and even licenses being taken away from these drivers unless they stop the foolishness in this particular part of the track. It's just not worth it. The easiest place to pass is not breaking into turn one, but on the back straight. And they need to keep that momentum out of this turn to reach maximum speed along that back straight where they can get by two or three cars very clearly. Well, John and Calvin, another factor last night, it was dark, and some of the drivers said maybe that did affect them on finding their breaking point and their turn-in point. Tonight, that should not be a problem. It certainly did, Gary. I mean, the drivers did not have a chance to experience running under the lights. We have a lot of first-time drivers here. They don't have the experience of some of the guys who are coming back, people such as Bobby Orgel, Andy Lally. They were here last year, so they have that experience, and guys were missing their braking points. But the whole recipe was wrong to start with. We had very low temperatures. You've got low downforce in the cars and a very short window to get the braking done. Once again, 11 rookies representing uh, this field, seven different countries. We talked about the B-Series. That's the American Continental Championship. There are three drivers with those older model cars from 1990 through 1996, and they have a race within a race. As they come through the 24-degree banking of turn three, the pace car lights are off. We should have a green this time by. And remember, they will not negotiate that chicane once they take the first green. They'll actually complete lap one before they move into that chicane area. That's correct, and this is really a slow pace lap here. Last night when they were coming through the start finish and having to negotiate the chicane, I think the speed of the rolling starts was actually a problem, but right now we're ready to go green flag racing. They cannot accelerate till they see the green. You see Quintanilla there on the front, on the fourth row, the green and white car trying to make a break early. Meanwhile, it's like Orgel's on the power first, someone going low. I think that's TJ Bell trying to make a move, and Danny Weldon in the white car is mid-pack right now. Once the green came out, we saw three and four wide through that uh, double dog leg near the start finish line with the 24 degree bank and once again they will negotiate that chicane on the next lap in an effort to reduce speeds here on this very fast super speedway they're running a restrictor plate this year you see there he's actually pushing him look there danny weldon was getting a shove down the back straight away you see lally in the blue bowman up high you can certainly run two and three abreast as they come off at nascar turn four and head past the start finish line and this is where we had the problem area last night hopefully they're going to behave themselves and give themselves more room watch for tire smoke in the first half of the field safely through that uh, left-hander there's the right-hander it's clean so far someone a little wide in the back of the pack but it looks like we may have one and if we can get some green flag racing get some tire temperature generated let the tire pressures come up the car's handling will come to these drivers and then they're capable of putting on a great show well there's mark dismore right now in 18th position he started 17th lost one position on the opening lap that's the second generation driver his dad of course a contender in the pet boys indy racing league we saw Dan Weldon lead uh, 22 of the 30 laps last night, but under some green flag racing, at one point he dropped back to fourth. 
before we will slingshot his way back on the back stretch to take the lead. I believe that maybe Jonathan Bottoms, who's made the move to the front right now, he locks up the left front. What happens is that the suspension gets loaded there. You actually get some roll in the car. That's when you're going to lock up a break. You see Tommy Constantine, a little wide there, coming through the first part of the chicane. The rest of the drivers run and negotiate through there, and it looks like they're doing a clean job so far. Now, last year we had a double header. Same thing happened. One race was ugly with lots of crashes. The other race was very clean. Oh, it was flip-flop last year. The opening race was clean. Well, as uh, John said, they really got a tearing down in the driver's meeting. Glenn Murky really told them and laid down the law, and they also have a driver. Oh, look at that. Pushed him. Danny Weldon pushed down. I'm not sure if that's Aaron Justice or TJ Bell. Down onto the apron there, and you can see how to unsettle the car immediately. Well, Jonathan Bottoms continues to show the way in that yellow car, and you can see the gap that has developed. More tire smoke under braking. Where Danny Weldon is really quick is coming through the chicane. Look at this. Quintanier, I believe, is already up to the fourth position. He's a man on the move. Quintanier began back in the eighth position. Right now, he scored in fourth in that green car. And he's moved up, uh, no, back on board with the Dismore. And back to your lead pack as the gap uh, remains about the same between first and second. Bottom's really spread out there. Lally in the Bowman does not look as quick coming through that chicane. It looks like he has to slow it down a little bit more. And it looks like there's some smoke there coming from the engine cover on the 87 car. And I think they're going to be black flagging him and bringing him in because that's obviously a concern on these high-speed bankings if you are dropping fluid for the leading cars. That's David Blakey from White, Indiana, a suburb of Indianapolis. He had a good run last evening. You see there, things are starting to heat up. Quintanilla gets passed for fourth. I think it may be Aaron Justice uh, maybe sneaking up into the fourth position. Actually, it's TJ Bell, their teammates for Cape Motorsport. So Jonathan Bottoms continues to lead as we now have completed four laps and continue to race under green. A pleasant change of pace from what we had last night. Race now is Andy Lally. Third right now is Dan Weldon. I'm Reggie White. In all my life, I've had to be tougher than the next guy. After all, it takes a strong, powerful man to do what I do for a living. But I believe it takes even a bigger man to ask for help when life's problems get to be too much. But what's guided me through life's turbulent times has been my personal relationship with God. It's given me hope. It's given me peace. It's given me happiness. If life sometimes gets you down, if it just seems too much at times, there's a book that can start you on your way to a personal relationship with God. It's called Powerful Living, and it's an incredible book. It's honest, easy to read, and tells it like it is in helping you get your life back on track. Powerful Living, it can show you how to cope with the everyday problems that plague us all. Powerful Living is free. To get your free copy, just call this toll-free number. No obligation, and no one will call. Call now for your free copy of Powerful Living. Call now to start your personal relationship with God. If this is what you live for, the Outdoor Life Network is your network. It's the only place you can turn to for the tips and techniques that will inspire your next adventure. If you don't get OLN, call 1-800-OUTDOOR and ask your cable company to add the Outdoor Life Network at Venture TV. I used to wonder if I was too old to go back to school. Now I know I wasn't alone. I used to worry about my future. Now I know I have one. I used to wonder if I made the right decision. Now I know. I should have called sooner. Get a start on your future now. Call ITT Tech at 1-800-942-0099 for an informative brochure. That's 1-800-942-0099. Welcome back to the Lowe's Motor Speedway. Gary Lee alongside Calvin Fish here in the broadcast booth and down in the pit lane, John Bisignano as the uh, race develops for the front. It's really spreading out here. Three, four wide. You see Danny Weldon trying to uh, make his way through the chicane. Nice move there. He got down inside Bottoms. Bottoms drops to third. Andy Lally is now in the lead. And it's not uncommon on this particular type of racetrack that a, a leader could drop three or four positions in one fell swoop because they punch that hole in the air and two or three guys go by. We saw a move last night by Ian Lacey. He came out of nowhere. He came from the fifth position straight to the lead, but used the apron down in turn three to make it happen. Now you see Danny Weldon moves to the inside, and these drivers are going to try and hook up and try and pull away from the field. If they if they really fight too hard, what it means is you're going to be slow on the overall lap time. The pack is going to come back to them. But if they can just slipstream one another, there is a chance they can inch away from the field. Look at the speed there. I think that's... T.J. Bell once again going down the inside. Lally tries to turn in, squeezes him a little bit. A little aggressive there by Andy as he came through the chicane. You see Cameron, he won at Phoenix. And 
uh, he's actually back mid-pack at the moment. I think we're missing a right front wing on Orgel's car. The 19, the yellow 19, is missing the right front as he goes to the high side. Lally looks like he might have a problem there. He dropped several positions immediately, and actually we could be under court. No, actually, that's Orgel there, maybe trying to get the guys behind him to hook up and move their way to the front. He says, don't spread out. Let's hook up in a train. Well, they just get off the shot. I was going to show you that. Orgel has a front wing problem. He suffered some damage there in the early going. It's very tight through the chicane, possibly. Here they come. They're going down the back straight, and he clips Quintanilla. He tried to slipstream and got a little too close. Quintanilla may have had to check up, and then Weldon crowds TJ Bell down onto the apron. He gets a little unsettled, and Quintanilla comes back around the outside. Lap number seven, and we're still under green. And really, I think you have to talk about patience and Dan Weldon. Dan lost the point several times, and he's been very, very patient to work his way back. He really has done a great job, and uh, he was really heads up. It was very fast and furious last night, but he did a great job in accepting when someone was making a move. And here we see the same thing occur. T.J. Bell moves to the lead. Well, John Bisignano, you have to be impressed with how these guys are handling this uh, turn one area. Absolutely, I am impressed today as, as much as I was unimpressed last night. It's like watching a whole different group of drivers. They are doing what the Chief Stewart told them to do, not try and win the race under braking, but win it on the straightaways where you can pass easily and safely. Also, Orgill's crew says there's going to leave him out here. Of course, in a sprint race like this, there's no reason for him to come in. His race would be over if he stopped in the pits. So, yes, he does have the damaged wing, but they're going to leave him out there, guys. Would this create a, a push characteristic, though, in the corner? Although he has the 24-degree bank. Oh, a crash down here in the front straightaway. A car spinning all the way around as he started to make that turn in and continues on, so the green remains out. It really will affect his handling. It will affect the understeer, even though we really don't have any demanding downforce-type corners. It's really a suspension work and more at low speed. And around the banking, you really have the grip factor from the banking alone. Once again, he's signaling there to the drivers to hook up and push their way past Danny Weldon. Danny Weldon in the lead. And this is where Danny's really quick. He gets through the chicane exceptionally well. Look how he can get the power down. And he really breaks away there coming off that corner. Well, handling cannot be a big factor right now because he's still running in second position. That's right. What it does, though, affect is the drag factor of the car. Typically, you've got the wing pointing straight ahead, and now it's really just producing an air dam. And once he pulls out of the slipstream there, he's going to go to the left now, trying to go inside Danny Weldon as they go down into NASCAR 3. And there you see him. They're actually bump drafting there. Bobby Orgel is actually pushing Danny Weldon down the back straightaway. Now they should be wide open through this very fast NASCAR 3 and 4. And as they come off of 4, this is where they're going to spread open and go down past start finish line. Once again, he's trying to get someone to hook up with him and push him past Danny Weldon. But Danny Weldon is very fast. They're down to first gear. Watch the speed factor through there. Danny clips both apexes perfectly, hard on the power, close to the wall, up to second, then just accelerating through the gears. Credit the crew for giving him a great ride this afternoon. They really have. I mean, he has a great team, Danny, with uh, Primus Racing. He's got John Hayes, who's won the championship two years running with Zach Morioka in 97 and David Bernard last year. He comes in as a rookie in this series. That's a misnomer because he has a lot of experience on the uh, European road circuits. He has a lot of experience with cold weather coming from England. I can relate to that. Uh, Danny's used to running on cold tires, and he really heads up in this early going. He's willing to accept a pass there. TJ Bell has exceptional straight line speed. He's really able to slingshot these guys very quickly, as you see Orgel is struggling to do that, and that wing may be a factor. So Bell now has the point. His teammate, I believe, is Aaron Justice, is up to fourth. And there you see Orlando Quintanilla moving into the fifth position, and Lacey and Bottoms back now in uh, the top eight. Well, the Justice crew had to put that race car back together. He tore the left front off of it. Look at that, somebody's missing the left rear right now. And that's either Lacey or Wood. I can't identify a number right now, but the color scheme uh, kind of indicates it's one of those guys. And there you see the rear wheel bounding down the track there, so there's been some problems. Biz, you saw that. Well, we were standing right there again. This is the action spot to be in. To me, it looked like he actually lost the wheel he did not come in contact with the wall. The wheel came adrift from the car. He spun twice and then headed straight for the wall on the outside of turn one. But he got it stopped and turned straight. He didn't really do any damage to the car, except you see, he only has three wheels left. Wow, he came through there. He's lucky that didn't happen in a faster pass of the racetrack. It's very slow down there, relatively speaking, to the rest of the circuit. And uh, he's really lucky that it didn't come off going through uh, NASCAR 3 and 4. Give him about 30 minutes, Nils. Heart rate will be back to normal. Well, hopefully so. He's obviously 
obviously disappointed to be out of the event. Uh, his teammate is currently running in third position, and these cars are exceptionally fast. They've tried to look for the unfair advantage, as we call it in racing, by switching to a different uh, car manufacturer. We see a lot of Van Diemen's. We see the Tatters, which was very successful last year. And now we see this third manufacturer with the Magal in the fray as well. 12 laps now complete. Lap 13 being run under the yellow, our first yellow of the evening. That was not for a crash, but for a wheel exiting the race car. Well, we have higher temperatures this evening, so all of the drivers will have generated some tire temperature, and we're just hoping they don't have the same problem on the restarts. So under the yellow behind the pace car, they line up trying to keep the uh, heat in the tires as T.J. Bell continues to lead. Weldon rides in second position. One more look at a loose wheel here at the Lowe's Motor Speedway. Explosive, unrelenting, death divine. The most intense collection of heart-stopping crash action just got better. Now, for a very limited time, get the hottest-selling crash series ever, Crash Impact and Crash Impact 2, together for the first time at a hot new price of only $19.95. This special four-volume set is jam-packed with incredible, non-stop, blazing crash action from around the world. Motocross, Outlaw, Superbikes, Indy Cars, Stock Cars, Monster Truck, Grand Prix, and more. You've never seen extreme action like this for a price this low. Don't miss out. You get all four sensational tapes for the unbelievable price of only $19.95. That's right. Crash Impact 1 and 2. All four tapes. A $40 value for only $19.95. But only if you order now. To order, call 1-800-730-4499. That's 1-800-730-4499. Or send $19.95 plus $5.95 shipping and handling to the address on your screen. This happens here and only here. You get every race, every moment, live. This week, it's live coverage of the Formula One Grand Prix of Spain. Speed Vision, the Formula One season. How can you stay away? Speed Vision salutes those who defended our country. Welcome back to the Lowe's Motor Speedway. It's time now for the Yokohama Driver Profile. Here's John Bisignano. Dan Weldon has a great deal of experience in these Formula cars. Dan, three years of racing in Europe. Your second race and first race were very successful here in the United States. How do you find the competition here in the USA? I think it's uh, very much the same anywhere you go. There's always a few guys that are quick. But, I mean, I've came over here with my experience and made a big impression. So, obviously, I'd like to keep it that way. And uh, that's what I'll be trying to do all season. A fine win here in Charlotte. Will you be able to repeat that? Yeah, I mean, obviously it's a long championship and we've got to be a little bit more realistic about we can't go out and win every event. I mean, I'm going to want to win every event, but there might be situations where uh, it might be best to come second or third, let's say. But uh, I'll be looking for a win today and it, obviously if the situation arises where it's not possible, I'll be looking to score points. But I like to win a lot. There you are, a young driver who understands the importance of managing a season, getting those points. 15 laps complete, 15 laps to go for a loose wheel. And here is a look at uh, Ian Lacey's car. And uh, take a look at that left rear. Right there, you can see it, Garrett. It looks like the stub axle is actually pulled out. There should be a stub axle that comes through there. You can see the wheel pin locators right there. But uh, there should be a stub axle. So it looked like that pulled out, came off, and just loosened up the wheel. As they come through the chicane, you can see right now, the, right, the left rear is about to come loose. It's coming off there. And then you can just see right there, see in the frame right now, you can see that the wheel nut or stub axle has actually come off, bouncing against the wall, turns Ian around. This is where it's really dangerous. The wheel is flying, and lucky that it didn't come back into the cockpit. Well, so far, we've had six lead changes among three different drivers. Back to John Bisignano. Well, Andy Lally, you had a great race here yesterday, finishing third. There's been a lot of work done onto your car, but you're out of this race because of mechanical failure. What went wrong? Uh, we clipped the tire going in the uh, going in the chicane here. Uh, and it pulled the screws out of the upright. The car was running pretty good. We took the lead, and just unfortunate this happened. Well, it's very unfortunate. As we go green again, guys, they'll be coming around for the green flag. Here they come. Danny Weldon is uh, leading the pack now as they come down. Uh, to take green, he really gets a good jump here, accelerating away, and they are going to be negotiating this very tight chicane on the first lap. It's just on the very first lap of the race, they go straight through. Danny has a nice jump there, and 
leads them through. Here we see Dismal once again, mid-pack. This is where it's half things go. Someone turns it around. Broken suspension there on the other yellow car. Dismal cuts through the grass. So this is what happened last night. On these restarts, you've got all the cars close together and creating problems for everyone. Well, it appeared that everyone continued on. So the yellow flag does come out. Nope, somebody didn't continue on. No, we did. Now you can see that it was the one car spun, the yellow car here. I'm not sure which car this is right now. Can't get a number on that, but uh, he failed to negotiate the car that spun around. That's the number 11 car, which is uh, Rafael Ferrer, and uh, his day is done. Well, let's take a look again at while we're still under yellow, headed for that left-hander. Mid-pack. Here they come down, heavy braking. Ferrer goes to the inside and just gets in way too hot. Turns the 77 car around, which is Primer, and uh, then got caught up in the incident himself. So he created the incident in the first place, and then ultimately that's what took him out. And everyone else apparently was able to continue on. Just too aggressive there, missed his braking point, got into the back of the car in front of him, who's slowing up for the rest of the field. And uh, we're going to get another look at this right now as the rest of the uh, field tries to turn themselves around. You see a guy there doing uh, 360s donuts as he tries to get back on the power. See the two cars in front, they see the yellow car tagging the white and green car, turning primer around, and then as he turns around, it tears off the left suspension. One car in the pit lane, that is Larry Foyt. Comes to the attention of uh, his crew. Well, let's visit with uh, Ian Lacey, Biz. Well, Ian L Lacey took a wild ride there. Did you have any indication that you had a problem with the left rear? Yeah, we had a kind of funny feeling for about two laps there before it finally broke. I thought maybe we were getting a flat tire, but I couldn't see in the mirror, so we didn't want to come in. I just tried to hang on the best I could and got by uh, Tom Woods there, going into the chicane, and on the way out it broke and lost the left rear wheel. We need that, so... How could you stay out there at 156 miles an hour knowing that you had that kind of a problem? Well, I was moving around a little bit, but it seemed to be okay. You know, it's just a chance you got to take. If you pit, you'll be right at the back of the field. So, so I had to stay out, try and catch up to Bobby if we could. Now, we had a bunch of green flags here, a bunch of green laps. There was a totally different attitude as far as the drivers going out on the track, and they were doing much better in this turn one. Why? Yeah, far better race. Everybody's being a little more patient, especially all the front runners. And I think... Everybody was probably in the slot where they should have been due to the single car qualifying, whereas yesterday we, uh, we qualified just with a green session, everybody on track. And if you got a good toe, you might be farther up the field than you're used to. So, now, Is it better to be running when there's more light? Last night you were definitely under the artificial lights, and was that more of a problem with the braking? Uh, not really. It's, it was pretty nice last night. It was almost brighter than it is right now because it's so cloudy. So, no, nah, I think it was about the same. Well, this guy wants to go racing no matter what the weather is, guys. He is really game to stay out there, 156 miles an hour with a very wobbly left rear. No way. 11 laps to go. You saw Larry Foyt climb out of that orange number 14 going into this evening's race. He was tied with Andy Lally for eight in the point standings. So he'll drop out of the top 10 after this uh, DNF. Here we see uh, Lacey's teammate Bobby Ogley still got that right front wing there uh, stuck up in the air. That's going to hurt him and uh, seemed like he was unable to pull out on Danny Weldon and really make the move. So that's certainly creating some extra drag in the car and is affecting his straight line speed and will ultimately affect his strategy in this race. You mentioned before about Andy or about uh, Dan Weldon knowing how to drive in the cold and that's kind of like a driver who, who does well on wet pavement. There is a talent to driving on cold pavement. There really is, and I think Danny's certainly going to be a factor when we get to the road courses, as that's really where his background has been. Well, 11 laps to go. We'll turn them loose, but first we'll take this commercial break. Invite you to come back with more racing from the Lowe's Motor Speedway here in Charlotte. Hey! No, down here. Instead of running out for stamps, shouldn't you be running your business? Imagine a simpler way. Get the personal post postage meter from Pitney Bowes. Send mail without ever going out for stamps. Just weigh, punch in the postage, and voila. Professionally metered mail and no wasted postage. You can also add a personal message to get your mail noticed. And postage refills by phone in 30 seconds, day or night. <laughs> now listen up, because here's what you'll get. Besides a lot more time. You'll get the postage meter and money-saving electronic scale. So there's no wasted postage. For a 90-day free trial. Free is good. You'll also get the mail marketer software. Create really nifty direct mail to help your business grow. Call now for your 90-day free trial, and you'll also get our mail marketer software absolutely free. Now I'll watch your business grow. Hey, I look good in red. The personal post postage meter from Pitney Bowes. <laughs> Who else? What is Speed Vision? What makes you want to mortgage your house? It's hiking in and Schumacher getting busy and you four-wheel drift in the family car. It's that Harley your wife made you sell. You know, 
your ex-wife. It's Amelia and her Electra. It's all the greatest racing flicks from the big screen. That's Speed Vision, and you got it. So turn on Speed Vision before the 99 season catches you by. missed a thing as the green flag flies and racing resumes here at the Lowe's Motor Speedway. Gary Lee along with Calvin Fish and John Bisignano as you ride on board or go and now on board with Dismore. Dismore there mid pack trying to make a move. Uh, I spoke to his father before the event and he said he's learning a lot. He really thought he was going to come out here and really be a force. But he's realizing just how competitive this series really is. Well, of course it's important to get laps in the race car and, and do it with all four wheels hanging on the race car as well. Look at the two teammates here. I think it's TJ Bell and Aaron Justice working together, and Bobby Orgel goes high. Got one of the Cape Motorsports cars tucked in behind him. I can't identify the number there. I think it's Bell. He's very right on the edge there. He's obviously running a very low downforce setup as he goes high. Danny Weldon tucks underneath, and he's very strong under braking here. Three abreast. Someone has to give. You have to be impressed at how well that number 19 car, that yellow 19, runs at speed with that wing askew. It really is amazing. He just got uh, probably pushed along a bit by TJ Bell there, was able to make the move on Weldon. And uh, we're running these restrictor plates, and that really affects the acceleration factor of these cars. So when you're by yourself, you don't have the horsepower that they're used to. They're about 20 horsepower down in an effort to contain these speeds. It was the fast qualifier this afternoon. As uh, you indicated, they put these cars back together. Good battle for third position. They had to practice and qualify this afternoon. And race great battle for third position two teammates there we've got Aaron Justice and up to the front we see Danny Weldon goes back to the front ahead of Orgel and the battle continues for third spot bottoms in the yellow car trying to attack and get down the inside I believe it's Aaron Justice currently in third he goes low Quintanilla looking to get on the brakes late oh Weldon a little sideways there in the first half of the chicane Orgel should get him a run on him here now it's getting a little wild we're getting down towards the conclusion of the event and now the guys are really going to get aggressive and try and make their move to the front so eight laps to go now. Here we see Orgel. He pulls up on Weldon. Right under his gearbox. See if he's going to bump draft him down the back straight away. There he goes. He's actually touching him in the gearbox there, Gary. And we see that Munez is down on the apron. That's actually uh, Weldon's teammate. There you see one of the Cape Motorsports cars. I believe that's Justice. He's really got a strong car underneath him here today. He tore off some front suspension in a late breaking move last evening, but he's looking good here today as Weldon protects that inside line. He's going to stay a little bit lower in these closing laps to try and protect his position as we get towards the checkered flag. Lap 22 just completely. And again, Weldon, who won here last night, now leads the point standings, won the point again. And you have to wonder just how the handling has been affected by that askew right front wing. Well, it's certainly affecting things, but as they work together, he can still be a factor here. Here we see TJ Bell. Look at that. He's actually moving in. He's right underneath the gearbox, very close there. Back to the lead. Justice makes a big slide down the inside. Look at the speed he has as he goes underneath Weldon and uh, Orgel at the same time. John Bisignano. I actually talked to Orgel before the race about how this track with its banking helps the drivers. He can go around this track at 110 miles an hour and the steering can be absolutely neutral and he'll still make it around the middle groove. That wing may not be such of a problem as it would be at other tracks, guys. The banking here will turn the car and keep it where it's supposed to be. And we have a six car battle for the lead as uh, Quintanilla joins the fray as well. Orgel in second, Weldon by this time. He was very smart last evening. He got pinched a couple of times, got out of the gas and ultimately went on to take the checkered flag. Aaron Justice was spectacular last night. In fact, at Phoenix, he spun one to the back of the pack and came roaring back through for a top 10 finish. Look at this, about 140 miles an hour down that back straightaway. They're bump drafting, just trying to push each other along with the restricted place. This really has a dramatic effect. Last year, they were able to attain speeds of 158 miles per hour by using this bump drafting technique. Oh, look at this, three wide to that left-hander. Gary now, no, the three abreast, someone has to give. Weldon there, heads up once again. He can tell that uh, Org was down on the inside of him, going into the right-hander, gave a little bit of space. He's been told, work for points here today. You're in the lead in the championship. Cameron has struggled here all weekend, currently back in eighth position, who's his closest pursuer in the championship. Five laps to go the next time by. Someone there having a problem. That's the car number 59. And... Uh, John Groom. That's one of the uh, the B cars, the 
American Continental Championship contender. You see Quintanilla up to fourth position. He's going to make a move on Weldon now. Quintanilla ran very strong at Phoenix in the first event, qualifying on the outside of the front row, had a quick spin in the race, but came back to set fastest lap. He's going to be a factor here as the laps dwindle. There's the gap between first and second. Lead through there, Cameron. He's second in points. He's trying to get to the front. We'll take a quick break and come back for the finish at the Lowe's Motor Speedway. Before he won Indy. Before he ruled the brickyard. Before he was Pep Boy's Indy Racing League champion. He ran USAC. USAC, the starting line for champions. Come on, Jimmy. Where's Mom taking us? To buy a copier or printer. Maybe both. Ooh. Yeah, Mom owns her own business. That's a very important job. Yeah, she's really fussy about getting a good deal. This could take forever. This will help. What's this? It's the number for a rebate on a Xerox digital copier printer. It'll save the day. Oh, no. So many choices. Damn it. Hey! Mom! Look! Xerox. Digital quality copies, digital reliability, the built-in laser printer, too. $449 for Xerox. Wow. The rebate. Oh, yeah. Some guy in a dress said call this number for a rebate. Rebate? Th that means it's only $3.99. Jimmy, this is not a dress. Yeah, right. Get a $50 rebate certificate only by calling 1-800-392-4701. There is the battle up in front. That is the battle for the lead. Aaron Justice has it. Bobby Orville runs in second position, just inches back there, and here comes that number five of Dan Weldon to the inside. Well, he came from nowhere. He really has a strong car as well, and he's going to be a factor here in these closing four or five laps. Look at him. Slices down to the inside. Gets inside of Justice. Great move there. Here we see a slower car. Hopefully he'll be up on the banking and out of the way. And he moves high. Good move there by the slower car. Obviously in radio communication with his team. How many times last night and tonight have we seen Dan Weldon shuffle back to third, fourth, and fifth? And he has the ponies to come right back at will. He does, and he has a good car as well. He really is able to accelerate quickly off the chicane. But you can see the drafting effect here. Orgel working with Justice. The two Englishmen, Dominic and Nicholas Cape. Running the Cape Motorsports team, they have two very strong cars here this evening and currently lead the event with Justice. So right now, Weldon needs a drafting partner. That would be uh, Quintanilla in that green and white number 40, a second-generation driver from Mexico. Across the stripe here, I believe we have three laps to go now, and Danny Weldon again backs out. A little sideways there from Justice. That's going to cost him some exit speed. Should allow Orgel to get a good run on him. And it looks like that wing is still in the position. I thought it was gone for a moment, but it's just the underside is a different color. It's still in the same position. It hasn't moved. What happens is the chief steward will keep a careful eye on that. If it becomes dangerous, he would black flag him and bring him in. But right now, it doesn't look like it's a problem. So it's Justin, Orgel, Weldon, and Keatonia. And there goes Weldon on his own without a draft partner. Down to the inside, three laps to go as they cross the stripe this time. It'll be two to go, and Kitania gets a great run. He's down low. Hopefully Danny can see him. He'll be in radio communication with John Hayes. This is what happened last night. They're going to pinch him a little bit there. Danny has to get out of it. Bobby flies to the outside. Danny gets back down the inside, gets inside just as Kitania leads the race with two laps to run. Is his dad here this weekend? I've not seen Roberto. Is, is Bert here? He is here, and he's going to be very excited right now. He's really pumped a lot of money into the effort there this year. They've done a great job. They've got Roberto uh, Lozano over here from Mexico. He's uh, been uh, instrumental in guys such as Adrian Fernandez with uh, his success over the years, and uh, he's a great guy to have in your camp as well. He goes back to the inside and takes the lead away, coming down with a l less than two laps to go. It's kind of like Daytona or Talladega drafting. You don't want to be on the lead on the last lap. That's right. It's going to be white flag as we cross the stripe this time. Justice goes back to the front. Orgel protects the inside line. Not Weldon, enough, though. Weldon goes inside. He's got a strong car here, and they're going to try and go side to side. This is going to hurt him. Together. They touch together. I think someone may have gone around there. Quintanilla looks like he's a little sideways if we try and look back in the pack. 
Yes, I believe he did turn it around, so that cost Quintanilla dearly. And you can see now, Justice has a big break. Orton was very aggressive there. He didn't let uh, Weldon have that left side, try to go side by side through the chicane. Ultimately, it cost Rolando Quintanilla. Battle now is for second. I think Justice has this one in hand. Orgo weaves. Weldon goes to the high side. They're going to fight all the way down to the flag. And you see TJ Bell coming back into the frame. He's going to be a factor. Weldon slices back down underneath Orgo. Justice is going to score his first Formula Ford 2000 victory. Pumps the fist. Weldon clinches well second. second. Great race. Great race. That was exciting. That's what we should have seen last night, Gary. And Orville takes third position. Fourth going to the 23 of Bell. Justice just did a great job. What happened there? He got to the front with one lap to go. It shouldn't have been the ideal position to be in. But when Orgel and Weldon went side by side through the chicane, it allowed them to uh, give a break to Justice, and he took advantage of a scoring a great win here tonight. Aaron Justice picks up his first victory. Dan Weldon with a pretty good uh, finishing uh, percentage so far. He was second at Phoenix, won last night, second here this evening. Uh, the Orgel with the camera car takes third. T.J. Bell was fourth. And Jonathan Bottoms rounding out the top five. We have had some great action this evening. Take a look at the action coming into that chicane on the last lap. It all really came down to this one left-right combination. See Justice in front. Weldon goes down low inside Orgel. Typically, you'd give that up, but this is now on the last lap. So Orgel tries to stay wheel to wheel there. Look how close. They actually touch. The left front of Orgel and the right front of Weldon touch. This really slows them up. Right behind them, Quintanilla got in problems. He turned it around. Orgel continues, but at a reduced pace, and this really gave the break to Justice. Yeah, and Quintanilla in that little altercation, that fracas down there dropped from uh, a third, fourth position finish to seventh position on the official rundown. So we've had 11 lead changes among six drivers, but the victory going to number 24, Aaron Justice, picks up the win here at the Lowe's Motor Speedway. We'll be back for a visit in Victory Lane. We're on the highway of life and we're going, going, going. Triple layer protection to help stop leaks sponsors this traffic report. Well, get ready for delays. Really, really long delays. Hey, live and learn and then get loves. Those new ones. The reviews are coming in and people are saying Arnold Palmer Golf's Heart and Soul should be in every golfer's home. Never before seen photos and home movies as well as exclusive interviews. I met Winnie on Tuesday. On Saturday night, I asked her to marry me. Included as conversations with the king, more memorable moments, and a peek at the making of the documentary. Over two hours devoted to one of the most legendary athletes of our time, Arnold Palmer. Call now to order. This happens here and only here. You get every race, every moment, live. This week, it's live coverage of the Formula One Grand Prix of Spain. Speed Vision, the Formula One season. How can you stay away? Well, an exciting race just won by Aaron Justice over these drivers. Dan Weldon took second. Bell was third. Orgel was fourth. And Jonathan Bottoms in the fifth position. Then it was Cameron, Steve Reichert, Rolando Quintanilla, Larry Obert. It was then Tom Wood rounding out the top ten. Now let's go to John Bisignano in Victory Lane. Well, Aaron Justice, this is a little bit different atmosphere for you than last night. You went out of the race because of a mistake you made yourself, but here you are, right back where you belong, in the winner's circle. Congratulations. That's right. I'm so happy. I mean, last night you guys interviewed me because I, I made a mistake in the chicane, and I just I can't tell you how grateful I am to my team, Cape Motorsports, Dominic Nicholas. Torco Race and Oils, my God, they've done everything for me. Quicksilver Race Engines. There's just so many people, I can't even tell you, that made it happen here today. And, you know, I was able to put it together on the track, but it's the faith that these people have in me to come back after a disaster like yesterday. It's incredible. What about that great pass for the lead? My gosh, how sweet that had to be. Well, it was pretty sweet. I mean, there were a lot of neat passes out there, but the best was coming out of this corner, out of the chicane on the last lap and breaking, a, breaking that uh, draft. That, then you knew you had it. It was incredible. Well, congratulations again. Let's hope you're up here for many more victory circles where you belong. Thank you very much. Well, of course, this series doing exactly what it's supposed to do, giving young drivers the opportunity to get some lap time here in America. 
maybe uh, to move on to the Pep Boys in the Racing League. Certainly is, and uh, we see a lot of great drivers here currently running. Uh, Greg Ray sits on the pole for tonight's IRL race. He's a ex-Formula 2000 guy, and uh, Robbie McGee, who actually raced here in the events last year, uh, qualified externally well at 13th position in his uh, debut. So these guys are capable. They can put together a race like tonight and get some laps under the belt. They put on a spectacular show. Well, we had 11 rookies, and uh, Tommy Constantine, Finished in the top 10, so a good rookie drive for him. And it's a case like Mark Dismore Sr. said, I want my kid, Mark Jr., to get laps. It takes laps in the race car. It does take laps. It takes a number of events. And uh, when we saw a race like last night, particularly where it's run under yellow most of the time, the guys aren't getting the experience that they need. A totally different race tonight. It really parallels what we had last year. We had one very ugly race last year, one very clean race, same this time. Well, I gave Brian Till, who's the uh, instructor and coach with these guys, a hard time last night, so I have to give him some uh, credit tonight. He certainly did a great job, and Glenn Murky, the chief steward, they really got down on these guys, and uh, they performed admirably. Well, Biz, let's visit with second and third positions. Well, maybe one of the most exciting finishes here is the man who won last night, came in second today, going into turn one. There you are, banging wheels right down to turn one. Yeah, I know. It was a tough race all along. There were some good guys. We were battling it out all through the race. And, I mean, I'm really, really disappointed not to win because I put on a strong performance last night, and I thought I put a strong enough performance in today to actually win. So I'm disappointed in that respect not to win. The team have worked hard. I've worked hard. So in that... In that respect, I'm disappointed, but it was an excellent race. I mean, we put on a great race for the crowd, as you can see, and it was good fun. How would you get by Orgel on that back run there? You had banging wheels with each other, but somehow you came out with more speed. Yeah, for um, going into turn three and four, I just managed to get a bit of a run on him, and he sort of jinked to the inside, and I went to the outside, and I just managed to get a little bit of Aaron's wind, and he pulled me along just so I could take the second place. What do you think of racing like this on these oval tracks? Your second oval, your third oval run ever, second oval track, you have two seconds and one first. You must love this kind of racing. Yeah, I mean, it's excellent racing from a thinking point of view. It teaches you to be patient, precise, and you've obviously got to trust one another because you're driving that close at high speeds. You have to trust one another. But it's, it's gone well for me so far. I would have just preferred three wins. Congratulations. Thank you. TJ, my gosh, you saw excitement all around you, above you, behind you, below you, but you kept it clean to bring it home in third place. Yeah, I'd just like to thank uh, K Motorsports, Eldorado Bus Sales, and uh, Mirror Race Products. It was a tough battle. I mean, we was far back as seventh and last lap come come past uh, Bobby O and just beat him at the line for third. I'm really happy. It's start off as a great year already so where did you have an advantage to make those passes all the way back in seventh place but every once in a while you're able to find some extra speed to make a pass it just seemed like uh, if i got through the chicane really really clean i could get a really great run onto him through down the back straightaway into three and four and get him coming down back into the chicane congratulations tj there it is guys rule number one get out of the slowest corner best so that you can take that speed and carry it all the way down the long, long straightaway, and he did it perfectly. We ended up in third place. Sounds like a driving school instructor to me. Well, of course, Dan Weldon with a, a win in two seconds will certainly pad his points lead. In his effort to clinch the championship, we'll take this break and come back with more. Stay with us. Homeowners, if your lawn is too big for an ordinary walk-behind mower and you'd rather walk than ride, Call now for your free catalog all about the revolutionary DR46 all-terrain lawnmower. This pro-style DR mows an amazing 46 inches wide and has big power-driven wheels and front-mounted casters for easy turning and maneuvering. With four speeds, you can mow wide open areas fast or slow down for precision trimming. There's even power reverse for backing out of tight spots. The DR has the power to mow tall grass and can mow slopes and wet areas where you'd never take a rider. So if you're tired of spending all day mowing and you'd rather not sit down on the job, call now for all the facts about the DR46 lawnmower. Call toll-free 1-800-356-8383 for your big free package all about the DR46 all-terrain lawnmower. Plus special savings now in effect. That's 1-800-356-8383 for free DR details. And now for a crash course on women's questions you should never answer. Why don't you run away? Is your room? Tell me about the other girls. It's the movie that saw James Caan's career take off. Redline 7000, Saturday at 11 Eastern. So how did I get to be a big shot in sports journalism? Well, it's like anything else in life. It's not who you are, it's who you're related to. 
I'm Mike Tyson's cousin. No, seriously, why would I make this stuff up? Mike was adopted by his trainer, Customato, and Cus's niece, Geraldine, is my Aunt Jerry by marriage, so I'm his cousin. Thanks, cousin Mike, I appreciate it. Reference to Mike Tyson is not an implied endorsement. Your mileage may vary, and references to living characters, intentional or otherwise, is dead. Member FDIC. Well, an exciting race just won by Aaron Justice over these drivers. Dan Weldon took second, Bell was third, Orgel was fourth, and Jonathan Bottoms in the fifth position. What exactly did that chief steward tell him, Biz? Well, we're going to find out. Glenn Murky is the chief steward here. I think it was master of discipline this morning. Glenn, you must be happy with the improvement in the driving in the second round here. Well, obviously we are. Uh, we had some had some problems last night that uh, I need to talk to the guys and to get them to calm down. And you know, we know that this race is a 30 lap race, and and if they take their time and be patient, they can they can put on a great show. And I think that showed tonight. We had a great race, and I'm real pleased with the improvements. Now you're going to look at the tapes and see if anybody did anything wrong. Will there be any suspensions or fines? You think after this, or was it clean enough for you? Well, certainly this race, the improvement that they've shown, uh, that they've shown uh, will certainly uh, make me a lot easier on any po potential penalties. But uh, we're going to review that first race and, and sit down with some drivers that, that may have been a little bit over aggressive and try to calm them down for future races. Hey, guys, how would you like to be in charge of keeping these guys calm? That's why we're up in the broadcast booth, and he's the chief steward. Schedule coming up after these... Uh, ovals or a modified oval here at uh, the Lowe's Motor Speedway. They head off in May to the Mossport Park for a pair of races and then in uh, the early part of June to Mid-Ohio. Beautiful racetrack at Lexington, Ohio. Then at Atlanta with the Pet Boys Indy Racing League July 14th and uh, 16th through the 17th. Then Road Atlanta for a pair of races in July. End of July and August 1 at uh, Three Rivers. Back to Mid-Ohio in August. Late August, it's uh, Pikes Peak for a pair of races on the uh, one-mile oval there. And they wrap up the season with a pair of races at Homestead. So a lot of variety for these guys. A lot of variety, but a lot of road courses coming up, and that's ominous for the field when we look at Danny Weldon and his background. He won championships over in uh, Europe and England. Uh, he actually drove for the Van Diemen team and had my ex-mechanic, Mickey Galter, working after him over there. And uh, he's got a lot of potential to really dominate this championship in a certain way that David Bernard with the same team did last year. But there's a lot of competition out there. We're looking for guys such as Cameron to get back on form and some of these other guys like Orgel and uh, TJ Bell and Aaron Justice to give him a hard time. How about Keaton Nia? Well he's certainly shown flashes but uh, he was unlucky tonight. He really drove a great race, came through from starting eighth I believe it was, got up to the front, led the race for a couple of laps there and uh, really uh, unfortunate that he uh, dropped back in the last couple of laps. We talk about second generation drivers. His dad of course was competitive in the Indy Lights a number of years ago. You ran against uh, Roberto Quintanilla. It's got to be tougher for a, a young driver when his dad drove before. In the case of Mark Dismore, his dad is still very competitive. Well, it is in some respects, but also you've got to factor in that those guys have the experience. They've been through the same emotions and uh, they've had the same problems that their younger sons are doing now. And uh, hopefully they can relate their past experience and help these guys along. If they're too hard on them, that's a, a detriment. But if they advise them and try and get them to take their time and be patient and use this season as a training series, then I think it's great things for these guys. Use the old man's experience to cut off the top of the learning curve whenever possible so uh, once again our congratulations to Aaron Justice on the victory here at the Lowe's Motor Speedway we'll take this break and come back with more the U.S. Formula 2000 National Championship competition development advancement Visit our website today. Nasty storm. Wet road. Looks pretty bad, huh? No problem. That's the beauty of Subaru All-Wheel Drive, the ultimate safety feature. Thanks, kid. See, it automatically transfers power from the wheels that slip to the wheels that grip. And only Subaru puts it on every car they make. And that's no accident. Subaru, the beauty of all-wheel drive. Everyone starts the day with an equal challenge. A clean slate, a brand new run at life, and 24 hours to make it happen. What are you going to do with your 24? Speed 
Division celebrates the premier automobile endurance race 76 years in the making. The 24 Hours of Le Mans, live. 12 days of history lead to 24 hours of the finest endurance racing. Speed Vision, taking the day on 24 hours at a time. Speed Vision's month-long salute to the 24 Hours of Le Mans begins Memorial Day at 6.30 Eastern. Tonight's race has been brought to you by Yokohama Tire Corporation. Turn on technology with Yokohama Tires. So once again, Aaron Justice wins round number three here at the Lowe's Motor Speedway over Dan Weldon. Bell was third, Orgel was fourth, and Jonathan Bottoms in the fifth position. Final comments from the pit lane, John Bisignano. Well, I'll tell you one interesting thing during this event is that we had at least a half dozen in-car drivers down here watching these brave young drivers in USF 2000. This is the road to Indy, and if you're a young professional driver, it's the place to be. It's going to be great racing all year long here on Speed Vision. Well, 11 lead changes among six drivers, Calvin. Well, we saw a lot of action at the front and certainly mid-pack as well, but it's really the action up front with those guys. They were very heads up, drove a great race, unfortunately lost Quintanilla there at the end. He spun around, but the top three or four put on a great show. And that's the type of action that you'll see all season as we bring you all the coverage here on Speed Vision. So, of course, now they go off to the road course up at the Bowmanville, Ontario, and that's certainly a challenging course. Oh, absolutely. It's one of the most awesome and demanding road course circuits that we run on in North America, and uh, this is going to challenge these guys just as the chicane and the high banks of uh, the Lowe's Motor Speedway did here this weekend. Only three races in so far, and uh, a total of 15 for the season. Dan Weldon with uh, two seconds and a first continues to lead the point standing. So for Calvin Fish and John Bisignano, I'm Gary Lee. Thanks for joining us. So long from the Lowe's Motor Speedway. Coming up, legendary Ascot Speedway takes a final bow. The stars come out at the Hollywood Stunt Drivers Benefit Show. Jay Orberg shows us his latest creations. We're off to Le Mans, France, and the excitement of the fabled 24 Hours of Le Mans. All this and more coming up right here on Wild About Wheels. First up, the final days of a dirt track legend. In the quiet glow of Southern California's perpetual sunshine, this empty racetrack fails to express how many countless thrills, spills, and surprises have unfolded here for nearly four decades. Gardena, California stands one of America's longest running theaters of speed, Ascot Park. Since 1957, it has worked hard at earning the right to be called a legend. Ask anyone from anywhere in North America or beyond who's ever dreamed of racing a thundering sprint car around a loose dirt surface where they dreamed of doing it, and they'll probably tell you Ascot Park. Well, Ascot is one of, you know, the the milestones of racing, sprint car racing. I mean, it's been here, you know, as long as sprint car racing's been around. As far as I'm concerned, it's uh, one of the best racetracks in the country. This is something the American people uh, feel like it's a part of their sport, and I think they always will. The Ascot story began with one of motorsports' most bigger-than-life personalities, J.C. Agajanian. To his friends, and even those who didn't know him personally, he was simply Aggie. Aggie was always around race cars and was always the consummate promoter. So in 1947, he took his first trip to Indianapolis to see the 500, planning to build and enter a car there later on. Five years later, in 1952, his number 98 car, the number that all of his future race cars would wear, won the Indy 500, driven by Troy Ruttman, who at the time was only 22 years old, one of the youngest drivers ever to win the 500. Five years later, Agajanian's dreams of building and operating his own track were realized when Ascot Park opened in Gardena, California. With a wild assortment of dizzy racing action, from sprint cars to motorcycles and anything else that the canny promoter thought would give people a good show. Over the years, Agajanian's style and flair attracted the attention of some of the world's most influential people. They all seemed to take a liking to this colorful racing entrepreneur. 
And no matter who Aggie was rubbing elbows with, he always looked like he belonged there. Agajanian's sons, Kerry, J.C. Jr., and Chris, now run the Ascot operation. And Kerry can remember how racing was always a part of his growing up. From the first time I can remember uh, sounds or, or being at any, uh, uh, or having any recollection of it, I, I was at a racetrack. So we were always at tracks, and I always remember it. Uh, I remember being at a racetrack. Kerry recalls the first time he realized his dad was a celebrity. My first trip to Indianapolis in 1959, I was just just turning 18 years old and, and walking along the street behind him while he was uh, with uh, one of his uh, drivers and each person.